The Tenth Lesson of a Series of Lessons in Raja Yoga. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arabella Grayson. A Series of Lessons in Raja Yoga by Yogi Ramasharaka. The Tenth Lesson, Part Two. Each of us has a friend in our own mind, a score of them, in fact, who delight in performing services for us, if we will but allow them to do so. Not only have we a higher self to whom we may turn for comfort and aid in times of deep distress and necessity, but we have these invisible mental workers on the subconscious plane, who are very willing and glad to perform much of our mental work for us, if we will but give them the material in proper shape. It is very difficult to impart specific directions for obtaining these results, as each case must depend to a great extent upon the peculiar circumstances surrounding it. But we may say that the main thing needed is to lick into shape the material, and then pass it on to the subconscious mind in the manner spoken of a few moments ago. Let us run over a few cases wherein this principle may be applied. Let us suppose that you are confronted with a problem consisting of an uncertainty as to which of two or more courses to adopt in some affair of life. Each course seems to have some advantages and disadvantages, and you seem unable to pass upon the matter clearly and intelligently. The more you try, the more perplexed and worried do you become. Your mind seems to tire of the matter and manifest a state which may be called mental nausea. This state will be apparent to anyone who has had much thinking to do. The average person, however, persists in going over the matter, notwithstanding the tired condition of the mind, and its evident distaste for a further consideration of the subject. They will keep on forcing it back to the mind for consideration, and even at night time will keep thrashing away at the subject. Now this course is absurd. The mind recognizes that the work should be done by another part of itself, its digestive region in fact, and naturally rebels at the finishing up machinery being employed in work unsuited for it. According to the subconsciousing plan, the best thing for the man to do would be for him first to calm and quiet his mind. Then he should arrange the main features of the problem, together with the minor details, in their proper places. Then he should pass them slowly before him in review, giving a strong interest and attention to each fact and detail as it passes before him, but without the slightest attempt to form a decision or come to a conclusion. Then having given the matter an interested and attentive review, let him will that it pass on to his subconscious mind, forming the mental image of dropping it through the trap door, and at the same time giving the command of the will, attend to this for me. Then dismiss the matter from your conscious mind by an effort of command of the will. If you find it difficult to do this, you may soon acquire the mastery by a frequent assertion, I have dismissed this matter from my conscious mind and my subconscious mind will attend to it for me. Then, endeavor to create a mental feeling of perfect trust and confidence in the matter, and avoid all worry or anxiety about it. This may be somewhat difficult at the first trial, but will become a natural feeling after you have gained the confidence arising from successful results in several cases. The matter is one of practice, and like anything else that is new, must be acquired by perseverance and patience. It is well worth the time and trouble, and once acquired will be regarded as something in the nature of a treasure discovered in an unexpected place. The sense of tranquility and content, of calm and confidence, that comes to one who has practiced this plan, will of itself be worth all the trouble, not to speak of the main result. To one who has acquired this method, the old worries, fretting, and general stewed-up feeling will seem like a relic of barbarism. The new way opens up a world of new feelings and content. In some cases, the matter will be worked out by the subconscious mind in a very short time, and in fact we have known cases in which the answer would be flashed back almost instantly, almost like an inspiration. But in the majority of cases, more or less time is required. The subconscious mind works very rapidly, but it takes time to arrange the thought material properly and to shape it into the desired forms. In the majority of cases, it is well to let the matter rest until the next day, a fact that gives us a clue to the old advice to sleep over an important proposition before passing a final decision. If the matter does not present itself the following day, bring it up again before the conscious mind for review. You will find that it has shaped itself up considerably and is assuming definite form and clearness. But right here, and this is important, 
do not make the mistake of again dissecting it and meddling with it and trying to arrange it with your conscious mind but instead give it attention and interest in its new form and then pass it back again to the subconscious mind for further work you will find an improvement each time you examine it but right here another word of caution do not make the mistake of yielding to the impatience of the beginner and keep on repeatedly bringing up the matter to see what is being done give it time to have the work done on it do not be like the boy who planted seeds and who each day would pull them up to see whether they had sprouted and how much sooner or later the subconscious mind will of its own choice lift up the matter and present it to you in its finished shape for the consideration of the conscious mind the subconscious mind does not insist that you shall adopt its views or accept its work but merely hands out to you the results of its sorting classifying and arranging the choice and will still remains yours but you will often find that there is seen to be one plan or path that stands out clearly from the others and you will very likely adopt that one the secret is that the subconscious mind with its wonderful patience and care has analyzed the matter and has separated things before apparently connected it has also found resemblances and has combined things heretofore considered opposed to each other in short it has done for you all that you could have done with the expenditure of great work and time and done it well and then it lays the matter before you for your consideration and verdict its whole work seems to have been in the nature of assorting dissecting analyzing and arranging the evidence and then presenting it before you in a clear systematic shape it does not attempt to exercise the judicial prerogative or function but seems to recognize that its work ceases with the presentation of the edited evidence and that of the conscious mind begins at the same point now do not confuse this work with that of the intuition which is a very different mental phase or plane this subconscious working just mentioned plays an entirely different part it is a good servant and does not try to be more the intuition on the contrary is more like a higher friend a friend at court as it were who gives us warnings and advice in our directions we have told you how to make use of this part of the mind consciously and knowingly so as to obtain the best results and to get rid of worry and anxiety attended upon unsettled questions but in fact every one of us makes more or less use of this part of the mind unconsciously and not realizing the important part it plays in our mental life we are perplexed about a matter and keep it on our minds until we are forced to lay it aside by reason of some other demand or when we sink to sleep often to our surprise we will find that when we next think of it the matter has somehow cleared up and straightened itself out and we seem to have learned something about it that we did not know before we do not understand it and are apt to dismiss it as just one of those things in these lessons we are attempting to explain some of those things and to enable you to use them consciously and understandingly instead of by chance instinctively and clumsily we are teaching you mastery of the mind now to apply the rule to another case suppose you wish to gather together all the information that you possess relating to a certain subject in the first place it is certain that you know a very great deal more about any subject than you think you do stored away in the various recesses of the mind or memory if you prefer that term are stray bits of information and knowledge concerning almost any subject but these bits of information are not associated with each other you have never attempted to think attentively upon the particular question before you and the facts are not correlated in the mind it is just as if you had so many hundred pounds of anything scattered throughout the space of a large warehouse a tiny bit here and a tiny bit there mixed up with thousands of other things you may prove this by sitting down some time and letting your thoughts run along the lines of some particular subject and you will find emerging into the field of consciousness all sorts of information that you had apparently forgotten and each fitting itself into its proper place every person has had experiences of this kind but the work of gathering together the scattered scraps of knowledge is more or less tedious for the conscious mind and the subconscious mind will do the work equally well with the wear and tear on the attention in fact it is the subconscious mind that always does the work even when you think it is the conscious mind all the conscious mind does is to hold the attention firmly upon the object before it and then let the subconsciousness pass the material before it but this holding the attention is tiresome work 
and it is not necessary for it to expend its energies upon the details of the task, for the work may be done in an easier and simpler way. The best way is to follow a plan similar to the one mentioned a few pages back. That is, to fix the interested attention firmly upon the question before you until you manage to get a clear, vivid impression of just what you want answered. Then pass the whole matter into the subconscious mind with a command, Attend to this, and then leave it. Throw the whole matter off of your mind and let the subconscious work go on. If possible, let the matter run along until the next morning, and then take it up for consideration, when, if you have proceeded properly, you will find the matter worked out, arranged in logical sequence, so that your conscious attention will be able to clearly review the string of facts, examples, illustrations, experiences, etc., relating to the matter in question. Now many of you will say that you would like this plan to work in cases in which you have not the time to sleep over it. In such cases, we will say that it is possible to cultivate a rapid method of subconsciousing, and in fact many businessmen and men of affairs have stumbled upon a similar plan, driven to the discovery by necessity. They will give a quick, comprehensive, strong flash of attention upon the subject, getting right to the heart of it, and then will let it rest in the subconscious mind for a moment or two, killing a minute or two of time in preliminary conversation until the first flash of answer comes to them. After the first flash, and taking hold of the first loose end of the subject that presents itself to them, they will unwind a string of information and talk about the subject that will surprise even themselves. Many lawyers have acquired this knowledge and are what is known as resourceful. Such men are often confronted with questions of conditions utterly unsuspected by them a moment before. Practice has taught them the folly of fear and the loss of confidence at such moments, and has also impressed upon them the truth that something within them will come to the rescue. So presenting a confident air, they will manage to say a few platitudes or commonplaces while the subconscious mind is most rapidly gathering its materials for the answer. In a moment, an idea passes before his conscious and eager attention, sometimes so rapidly that it is almost impossible to utter them, and lo, the danger is over, and a brilliant success is often snatched from the jaws of an apparent failure and defeat. In such cases, the mental demand upon the subconscious mind is not voiced in words, but is a result of a strong mental need. However, if one gives a quick verbal command, attend to this, the result will be heightened. We have known of cases of men prominent in the world's affairs who made a practice of smoking a cigar during important business interviews, not because they particularly cared for tobacco, but because they had learned to appreciate the value of a moment's time for the mind to gather itself together, as one man expressed it. A question would be asked or a proposition advanced suddenly, demanding an immediate answer. Under the watchful eyes of the other party, the question party tried not to show, by his expression, any indication of searching for an answer, for obvious reasons. So, instead, he would take a long puff at the cigar, then a slow, attentive look at the ashes on its tip, and then another moment consumed in flicking the ash into the receptacle, and then came the answer, slowly. Well, as to that, or some other words of that kind, prefacing the real answer, which he had been rapidly framed by the subconscious mind, in time to be uttered in its proper place. The few moments of time gained had been sufficient for the subconscious mind to gather up its materials, and the matter to be shaped properly, without any appearance of hesitation on the part of the answerer. All of this required practice, of course, but the principle may be seen through it all and in every similar case. The point is that the man in such cases sets some hidden part of his mind to work for him, and when he begins to speak the matter is at least roughly licked into shape for him. Our students will understand, of course, that this is not advice to smoke cigars during interviews of importance, but is merely given to illustrate the principle. We have known other men to twirl a lead pencil in their fingers in a lazy sort of fashion and then drop it at the important moment but we must cease giving examples of this kind, lest we be accused of giving instructions in worldly wisdom, instead of teaching the use of the mind. The impressive pause of the teacher before answering his pupil's question is also an example of the workings of this law. One often says, Stop, let me think a moment. And during his pause, he does not 
really consciously think at all, but stares ahead in a dreamy fashion while his subconscious mind does the work for him, although he little suspects the nature of the operation. One has but to look around him to realize the importance and frequent application of this truth. And not only may the subconscious mind be used in the directions indicated on preceding pages, but in nearly every perplexity and problem of life may it be called upon for help. These little subconscious brownies are ever at our disposal and seem to be happy to be of service to us. And so far from being apt to get us in a position of false dependence, it is calculated to make us self-confident. For we are calling upon a part of ourselves, not upon some outside intelligence. If those people who never feel satisfied unless they are getting advice from others would only cultivate the acquaintance of this little home advisor within them, they would lose that dependent attitude and frame of mind and would grow self-confident and fearless. Just imagine the confidence of one who feels that he has within him a source of knowledge equal to that of the majority of those with whom he is likely to come in contact, and he feels less afraid to face them and look them fearlessly in the eyes. He feels that his mind is not confined to the little field of consciousness, but is an area infinitely greater containing a mass of information undreamed of. Everything that the man has inherited or brought with him from past lives, everything that he has read, heard, or seen, or experienced in this life, is hidden away there in some quarter of that great subconscious mind, and if he will but give the command, the essence of all that knowledge is his. The details may not be presented to his consciousness, often it is not, for very good occult reasons, but the result or essence of the knowledge will pass before his attention with sufficient examples and illustrations or arguments to enable him to make out a good case for himself. In the next lesson, we will call your attention to other features and qualities of this great field of mind, showing you how you can put it to work and master it. Remember, always the I is the master, and its mastery must always be remembered and asserted over all phases and planes of the mind. Do not be a slave to the subconscious, but be its master. Mantram or Affirmation I have within me a great area of mind that is under my command and subject to my mastery. This mind is friendly to me and is glad to do my bidding and obey my orders. It will work for me when I ask it and is constant, untiring, and faithful. Knowing this, I am no longer afraid ignorant or uninformed. The I is master of it all and is asserting its authority. I am master over body, mind, consciousness, and subconsciousness. I am I, a center of power, strength, and knowledge. I am I and I am spirit, a fragment from the divine flame. End of the tenth lesson Recording by Arabella Grayson The Eleventh Lesson of a Series of Lessons in Raja Yoga This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arabella Grayson A Series of Lessons in Raja Yoga by Yogi Ramasharaka The Eleventh Lesson Part 1. The Eleventh Lesson. Subconscious Character Building. In our last lesson, the Tenth Lesson, we called your attention to the wonderful work of the subconscious regions of mentation in the direction of the performance of intellectual work. Great as are the possibilities of this field of mentation in the direction named, they are equaled by the possibility of building up character by similar methods. Everyone realizes that one may change his character by a strenuous course of repression and training, and nearly all who read these lines have modified their characteristics somewhat by similar methods. But it is only of late years that the general public have become aware that character might be modified, changed, and sometimes completely altered by means of an intelligent use of the subconscious faculties of the mind. The word character is derived from ancient terms meaning to mark, to engrave, etc., 
and some authorities inform us that the term originally arose from the word used by the Babylonian brickmakers to designate the trademark impressed by them upon their bricks, each maker having his own mark. This is interesting in view of the recent theories regarding the cultivation of characteristics which may be found in the current Western works on psychology. But these theories are not new to the yogi teachers of the East, who have employed similar methods for centuries past in training their students and pupils. The yogis have long taught that a man's character was, practically, the crude character stuff possessed by him at his birth, modified and shaped by outside influences in the case of the ordinary man, and by deliberate self-training and shaping by the wise man. Their pupils are examined regarding their characteristics and then directed to repress the undesirable traits and to cultivate the desirable ones. The yogi practice of character building is based upon the knowledge of the wonderful powers of the subconscious planes of the mind. The pupil is not required to pursue strenuous methods of repression or cultivation, but on the contrary is taught that such methods are opposed to nature's plans and that the best way is to imitate nature and to gradually unfold the desired characteristics by means of focusing the will power and attention upon them. The weeding out of undesirable characteristics is accomplished by the pupil cultivating the characteristics directly opposed to the undesirable ones. For instance, if the pupil desires to overcome fear, he is not instructed to concentrate on fear with the idea of killing it out, but instead is taught to mentally deny that he has fear, and then to concentrate his attention upon the ideal of courage. When courage is developed, fear is found to have faded away. The positive always overpowers the negative. In the word ideal is found the secret of the yogi method of subconscious character building. The teachings are to the effect that ideals may be built up by the bestowal of attention upon them. The student is given the example of a rose bush. He is taught that the plant will grow and flourish in the measure that care and attention is bestowed upon it, and vice versa. He is taught that the ideal of some desired characteristic is a mental rose bush, and that by careful attention it will grow and put forth leaves and flowers. He is then given some minor mental trait to develop and is taught to dwell upon it in thought to exercise his imagination and to mentally see himself attaining the desired quality. He is given mantrams or affirmation to repeat for the purpose of giving him a mental center around which to build an ideal. There is a mighty power in words used in this way providing that the user always thinks of the meaning of the words and makes a mental picture of the quality expressed by them, instead of merely repeating them parrot fashion. The yogi student is trained gradually until he acquires the power of conscious direction of the subconscious mind in the building up process, which power comes to anyone, oriental or occidental, who will take the trouble to practice. In fact, Nearly everyone possesses and actively uses this power, although he may not be aware of it. One's character is largely the result of the quality of thoughts held in the mind and of the mental pictures or ideas entertained by the person. The man who constantly sees and thinks of himself as unsuccessful and downtrodden is very apt to grow ideals of thought forms of these things until his whole nature is dominated by them and his every act works towards the objectification of the thoughts. On the contrary, the man who makes an ideal of success and accomplishments find that his whole mental nature seems to work toward that result, the objectification of the ideal. And so it is with every other ideal. The person who builds up a mental ideal of jealousy will be very apt to objectify the same and to unconsciously create condition that will give his jealousy food upon which to feed. But this particular phase of the subject properly belongs to our next lesson. This eleventh lesson is designed to point out the way by which people may mold their characters in any way they desire, supplanting undesirable characteristics by desirable ones and developing desirable ideals into active characteristics. The mind is plastic to him who knows the secrets of its manipulation. 
The average person recognizes his strong and weak points of character, but is very apt to regard them as fixed and unalterable, or practically so. He thinks that he is just as the Lord made him, and that is the end of it. He fails to recognize that his character is being unconsciously modified every day by association with others whose suggestions are being absorbed and acted upon and he fails to see that he is molding his own character by taking interest in certain things and allowing his mind to dwell upon them. He does not realize that he himself is really the maker of himself from the raw and crude material given him at his birth. He makes himself negatively or positively, negatively if he allows himself to be molded by the thoughts and ideals of others, and positively if he molds himself. Everyone is doing one or the other, perhaps both. The weak man is the one who allows himself to be made by others, and the strong man is the one who takes the building process in his own hands. The process of character building is so delightfully simple that its importance is apt to be overlooked by the majority of persons who are made acquainted with it. It is only by actual practice and the experiencing of results that its wonderful possibilities are borne home to one. The yogi student is early taught the lesson of the power and importance of character building by some strong practical example. For instance, the student is found to have certain tastes of appetite, such as a like for certain things and a corresponding dislike for others. The yogi teacher instructs the student in the direction of cultivating a desire and taste for the disliked thing and a dislike for the like thing. He teaches the student to fix his mind on the two things, but in the direction of imagining that he likes the one thing and dislikes the other. The student is taught to make a mental picture of the desired conditions and to say, for instance, I loathe candy. I dislike even the sight of it. And on the other hand, I crave tart things, I revel in the taste of them, etc., etc., at the same time trying to reproduce the taste of sweet things accompanied with a loathing, and a taste of tart things accompanied with a feeling of delight. After a bit, the student finds that his tastes are actually changing in accordance with his thoughts, and in the end they have completely changed places. The truth of the theory is then borne home to the student, and he never forgets the lesson. In order to reassure readers who might object to having the student left in this condition of reverse taste, we may add that the yogi teachers then teach him to get rid of the idea of the dislike thing and teach him to cultivate a liking for all wholesome things. Their theory being that the dislike of certain wholesome eatables has been caused by some suggestion in childhood or by some prenatal impression, as wholesome eatables are made attractive to the taste by nature. The idea of all this training, however, is not the cultivation of taste, but practice in mental training and the bringing home of the student the truth of the fact that his nature is plastic to his ego and that it may be molded at will by concentration and intelligent practice. The reader of this lesson may experiment upon himself along the lines of the elementary yogi practice as above mentioned, if he so desires. He will find it possible to entirely change his dislike for certain food, etc., by the methods mentioned above. He may likewise acquire a liking for heretofore distasteful tasks and duties, which he finds it necessary to perform. The principle underlying the whole yogi theory of character building by the subconscious intellect is that the ego is master of the mind, and that the mind is plastic to the commands of the ego. The ego or I of the individual is the one real permanent changeless principle of the individual. And the mind, like the body, is constantly changing, moving, growing, and dying. Just as the body may be developed and molded by intelligent exercises, so may the mind be developed and shaped by the ego if intelligent methods are followed. The majority of people consider that character is a fixed something, belonging to a man that cannot be altered or changed. And yet they show by their everyday actions that at heart they do not believe this to be a fact, for they endeavor to change and mold the characters of those around them by word of advice, counsel, 
praising or condemnation, etc. It is not necessary to go into the matter of the consideration of the causes of character in this lesson. We will content ourselves by saying that these causes may be summed up roughly as follows. 1. Result of experiences in past lives. 2. Heredity. 3. Environment. 4. Suggestions from others. And 5. Autosuggestion. But no matter how one's character has been formed, it may be modified, molded, changed, and improved by the methods set forth in this lesson, which methods are similar to what is called by Western writers autosuggestion. The underlying idea of autosuggestion is the willing of the individual that changes take place in his mind, the willing being aided by intelligent and tried methods of creating the new ideal or thought form. The first requisite for the change condition must be desire for the change. Unless one really desires that the change take place, he is unable to bring his will to bear on the task. There is a very close connection between desire and will. Will is not usually brought to bear upon anything unless it is inspired by desire. Some people connect the word desire with the lower inclinations, but it is equally applicable to the higher. If one fights off a low inclination or desire, it is because he is possessed of a higher inclination or desire. Many desires are really compromises between two or more conflicting desires, a sort of average desire, as it were. Unless one desires to change his character, he will not make any move toward it. And in proportion to the strength of the desire, so will be the amount of willpower that is put in the task. The first thing for one to do in character building is to want to do it. And if he finds that the want is not sufficiently strong to enable him to manifest the perseverance and effort necessary to bring it to a successful conclusion, then he should deliberately proceed to build up the desire. Desire may be built up by allowing the mind to dwell upon the subject until a desire is created. This rule works both ways, as many people have found out to their sorrow and misery. Not only may one build up a commendable desire in this way, but he may also build up a reprehensible one. A little thought will show you the truth of this statement. A young man has no desire to indulge in the excesses of a fast life. But after a while, he hears or reads something about others leading that sort of life, and he begins to allow his mind to dwell upon the subject, turning it around and examining it mentally and going over it in his imagination. After a time, he begins to find a desire gradually sending forth roots and branches, and if he continues to water the thing in his imagination, before long he will find within himself a blossoming inclination which will try to insist upon expression in action. There is a great truth behind the words of the poet. Vice is a monster of so frightful mien that to be hated needs but to be seen. Yet seen too oft familiar with her face, we first endure, then pity, and then embrace. And the follies and crimes of many a man have been due to the growing of desire within his mind, through this plan of planting the seed and then carefully watering and tending to it, this cultivation of the growing desire. We have thought it well to give this word of warning because it will throw light upon many things that may have perplexed you and because it may serve to call your attention to certain growing weeds of the mind that you have been nourishing. But remember always that the force that leads downward may be transmuted and made to lead upward, it is just as easy to plant and grow wholesome desires as the other kind. If you are conscious of certain defects and deficiencies in your character, and who is not, and yet find yourself not possessed of a strong enough desire to make the changes necessary, then you should commence by planting the desire seed and allowing it to grow by giving it constant care and attention. You should picture to yourself the advantages of acquiring the desirable traits of character of which you have thought. You should frequently go over and over them in your mind, imaging yourself in imagination as possessing them. 
you will then find that the growing desire will make headway and that you will gradually begin to want to possess that trait of character more and more. And when you begin to want to hard enough, you will find arising in your consciousness a feeling of the possession of sufficient willpower to carry it through. Will follows the desire. Cultivate a desire and you will find back of it the will to carry it through. Under the pressure of a very strong desire, men have accomplished feats akin to miracles. If you find yourself in possession of desires that you feel are hurtful to you, you may rid yourself of them by deliberately starving them to death, and at the same time growing opposite desires. By refusing to think of the objectionable desires, you refuse them the mental food upon which alone they can thrive. Just as you starve a plant by refusing it nourishing soil and water, so may you starve out an objectionable desire by refusing to give it mental food. Remember this, for it is most important. Refuse to allow the mind to dwell upon such desires and resolutely turn aside the attention and particularly the imagination from the subject. This may call for the manifestation of a little willpower in the beginning, but it will become easier as you progress, and each victory will give you renewed strength for the next fight. But do not temporize with the desire. Do not compromise with it. Refuse to entertain the idea. In a fight of this kind, each victory gives one added strength, and each defeat weakens one. And while you are refusing to entertain the objectionable guest, you must be sure to grow a desire of an entirely opposite nature, a desire directly opposed to the one you are starving to death. Picture the opposite desire and think of it often. Let your mind dwell upon it lovingly and let the imagination help to build it up into form. Think of the advantages that will arise to you when you fully possess it and let the imagination picture you as in full possession of it and acting out your new part in life strong and vigorous in your new found power. All this will gradually lead you to the point where you will want to possess this power. Then you must be ready for the next step, which is faith or confident expectation. Now faith or confident expectation is not made to order in most persons, and in such cases one must acquire it gradually. Many of you who read these lines will have an understanding of the subject that will give you this faith, but to those who lack it, we suggest that they practice on some trivial phases of the mental makeup, some petty trait of character, in which the victory will be easy and simple. From this stage, they should work up to more difficult tasks until at last they gain that faith or confident expectation that comes from persevering practice. End of the 11th lesson, part 1. Recording by Arabella Grayson. The 11th lesson of a series of lessons in Raja Yoga. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arabella Grayson. A series of lessons in Raja Yoga by Yogi Ramasharaka. The Eleventh Lesson, Part 2. The greater the degree of faith or confident expectation that one carries with him in this task of character building, the greater will be his success, and this because of well-established psychological laws. Faith or confident expectation clears away the mental path and renders the work easier, while doubt or lack of faith retards the work and acts as obstacles and stumbling blocks. Strong desire and faith or confident expectation are the first two steps. The third is willpower. By willpower, we do not mean that strenuous clenching of the fist and frowning brow thing that many think of when they say will. Will is not manifested in this way. The true will is called into play by one realizing the I part of himself and speaking the word of command from that center of power and strength. It is the voice of the I, and it is needed in this work of character building. So now you are ready for work, being possessed of 1. Strong desire, 
Two, faith or confident expectation. And three, willpower. With such a triple weapon, nothing but success is possible. Then comes the actual work. The first thing to do is to lay the track for a new character habit. Habit, you may ask in surprise. Yes, habit, for that word gives the secret of the whole thing. Our characters are made up of inherited or acquired habits. Think over this a little and you will see the truth of it. You do certain things without a thought because you have gotten into the habit of doing them. You act in certain ways because you have established the habit. You are in the habit of being truthful, honest, virtuous because you have established the habit of being so. Do you doubt this? Then look around. Or look within your own heart and you will see that you have lost some of your old habits of action and acquired new ones. The building up of character is the building up of habits and the changing of character is the changing of habits. It will be well for you to settle this fact in your own mind for it will give you the secret of many things connected with the subject. And remember this, that habit is almost entirely a matter of the subconscious mentality. It is true that habits originate in the conscious mind, but as they are established, they sink down into the depths of the subconscious mentality and thereafter become second nature, which, by the way, is often more powerful than the original nature of the person. The Duke of Wellington said that habit was as strong as ten natures, and he proceeded to drill habits into his army until they found it natural to act in accordance with the habits pounded into them during the drills. Darwin relates an interesting instance of the force of habit over reason. He found that his habit of starting back at the sudden approach of danger was so firmly established that no willpower could enable him to keep his face pressed up against the cage of the cobra in the zoological gardens when the snake struck at him, although he knew the glass was so thick that there could be no danger, and although he exerted the full force of his will. But we venture to say that one could overcome even this strongly ingrained habit by gradually training the subconscious mentality and establishing a new habit of thought and action. It is not only during the actual process of willing the new habit that the work of making the new mental path goes on. In fact, the yogis believe that the principal part of the work goes on subconsciously between the intervals of commend and that the real process is made in that way, just as the real work of solving the problem is performed subconsciously, as related in our last lesson. As an example, we may recall your attention to some instances of the cultivation of physical habits. A physical task learned in the evening is much easier to perform the following morning than it was the night before and still easier the following Monday morning than it was on the Saturday afternoon previous. The Germans have a saying that we learn to skate in summer and swim in winter, meaning that the impression passed on to the subconscious mentality deepens and broadens during the interval of rest. The best plan is to make frequent sharp impressions and then to allow reasonable periods of rest in order to give the subconscious mentality the opportunity to do its work. By sharp impressions, we mean impressions given under strong attention, as we have mentioned in some of the earlier lessons of this series. A writer has well said, So an act, reap a habit. So a habit, reap a character. So a character, reap a destiny. Thus recognizing habit as a source of character. We recognize this truth in our training of children, forming good habits of character by constant repetition, by watchfulness, etc. Habit acts as a motive when established so that while we think we are acting without motive, we may be acting under the strong motive power of some well-established habit. Herbert Spencer has well said, the habitually honest man does what is right, not consciously because he ought, but with simple satisfaction, and is ill at ease till it is done. Some may object that this idea of habit as a basis of character may do away with the idea of a developed moral conscientiousness, as for instance, Josiah Royce who says, the establishment of organized habit is never in itself enough to ensure the growth of an enlightened moral conscientiousness. But to such we would say that one must want to cultivate a high character before he will create the habits usual to the same. And the want to is a sign of the moral conscientiousness rather than the habit. And the same is true of the ought to side of the subject.
the ought to arises in the conscious mind in the beginning and inspires the cultivation of the habit, although the latter after a while becomes automatic, a matter of the subconscious mentality without any ought to attachment. It then becomes a matter of like to. Thus we see that the molding, modifying, changing, and building of character is largely a matter of the establishing of habits. And what is the best way to establish habits becomes our next question. The answer of the yogi is, establish a mental image and then build your habit around it. And in that sentence, he has condensed a whole system. Everything we see having a form is built around a mental image, either the mental image of some man, some animal, or of the absolute. This is the rule of the universe, and in the matter of character building, we but follow a well-established rule. When we wish to build a house, we first think of house in a general way. Then we begin to think of what kind of a house. Then we go into details. Then we consult an architect, and he makes us a plan, which plan is his mental image suggested by our mental image. Then the plan once decided upon, we consult the builder, and at last the house stands completed, an objectified mental image. And so it is with every created thing, all manifestation of a mental image. And so when we wish to establish a trait of character, we must form a clear, distinct mental image of what we wish to be. This is an important step. Make your picture clear and distinct and fasten it in your mind. Then begin to build around it. Let your thoughts dwell upon the mental picture. Let your imagination see yourself as possessed of the desired trait and acting it out. Act it out in your imagination over and over again as often as possible, persevering and continuously seeing yourself manifesting the trait under a variety of circumstances and conditions. As you continue to do this, you will find that you will gradually begin to express the thought in action to objectify the subjective mental image. It will become natural for you to act more and more in accordance with your mental image until at last the new habit will become firmly fixed in your mind and will become your natural mode of action and expression. This is no vague visionary theory. It is a well-known and proven psychological fact and thousands have worked marvelous changes in their character by its means. Not only may one elevate his moral character in this way, but he may mold his workaday self to better conform to the needs of his environment and occupation. If one lacks perseverance, he must attain it. If one is filled with fear, he may supplant it with fearlessness. If one lacks self-confidence, he may gain it. In fact, there is no trait that may not be developed in this way. People have literally made themselves over by following this method of character building. The great trouble with the race has been that persons have not realized that they could do these things. They have thought that they were doomed to remain just the creatures that they found themselves to be. They did not realize that the work of creation was not ended and that they had within themselves a creative power adapted to the needs of their case. When man first realizes this truth and proves it by practice, he becomes another being. He finds himself superior to environment and training. He finds that he may ride over these things. He makes his own environment and he trains himself. In some of the larger schools in England and the United States, certain scholars who have developed and manifested the ability to control themselves and their actions are placed on the role of a grade called the self-governed grade. Those in this grade act as if they had memorized the following words of Herbert Spencer. In the supremacy of self-control consists one of the perfections of the ideal man, not to be impulsive, not to be spurred hither and thither by each desire, but to be self-restrained, self-balanced, governed by the just decision of the feelings and counsel assembled, that it is which moral education strives to produce. And this is the desire of the writer of this lesson, to place each student in the self-governed class. We cannot attempt in this short space of a single lesson to map out a course of instruction in character building adapted to the special needs of each individual. But we think that what we have said on the subject should be sufficient to point out the method for each student to map out a course for himself following the general rules given above. As a help to the student, however, we will give a brief course of instruction for the cultivation of one desirable trait of character. 
the general plan of this course may be adapted to fit the requirements of any other case if intelligence is used by the student the case we have selected is that of a student who has been suffering from a lack of moral courage, a lack of self-confidence, an inability to maintain my poise in the presence of other people, an inability to say no, a feeling of inferiority to those with whom I come in contact. The brief outline of the course of practice given in this case is herewith given. Preliminary Thought you should fix firmly in your mind the fact that you are the equal of any and every man. You come from the same source. You are an expression of the same one life. In the eyes of the Absolute, you are the equal of any man, even the highest in the land. Truth is, things as God sees them, and in truth you and the man are equal, and at the last, one. All feelings of inferiority are illusions, errors, and lies, and have no existence in truth. When in the company of others, remember this fact and realize that the life principle in you is talking to the life principle in them. Let the life principle flow through you and endeavor to forget your personal self. At the same time, endeavor to see that same life principle behind and beyond the personality of the person in whose presence you are. He is by a personality hiding the life principle, just as you are. Nothing more, nothing less. You are both one in truth. Let the consciousness of the I beam forth, and you will experience an uplift and sense of courage, and the other will likewise feel it. You have within you the source of courage, moral and physical, and you have not to fear. Fearlessness is your divine heritage. Avail yourself of it. You have self-conscience, and for the self is the I within you, not the petty personality, and you must have confidence in that I. Retreat within yourself until you feel the presence of the I, and then will you have a self-confidence that nothing can shake or disturb. Once having attained the permanent consciousness of the I, you will have poise. Once having realized that you are a center of power, you will have no difficulty in saying no when it is right to do so. Once having realized your true nature, your real self, you will lose all sense of inferiority, and you will know that you are a manifestation of the one life and have behind you the strength, power, and grandeur of the cosmos. Begin by realizing yourself, and then proceed with the following methods of training the mind. Word Images it is difficult for the mind to build itself around an idea, unless that idea be expressed in words. A word is the center of an idea, just as the idea is the center of the mental image, and the mental image the center of the growing mental habit. Therefore, the yogis always lay great stress upon the use of words in this way. In the particular case before us, we should suggest the holding before you of a few words crystallizing the main thought. We suggest the words I am, courage, confidence, poise, firmness, equality. Commit these words to memory and then endeavor to fix in your mind a clear conception of the meaning of each word so that each may stand for a live idea when you say it. Beware of parrot-like or phonographic repetition. Let each word's meaning stand out clearly before you so that when you repeat it, you may feel its meaning. Repeat the words over frequently when opportunity presents itself and you will soon begin to notice that they act as a strong mental tonic upon you, producing a bracing, energizing effect. And each time you repeat the words understandingly, you have done something to clear away the mental path over which you wish to travel. Practice when you are at leisure and are able to indulge in daydreams without injury to your affairs of life, call your imagination into play and endeavor to picture yourself as being possessed of the qualities indicated by the words named. Picture yourself under the most trying circumstances, making use of the desired qualities and manifesting them fully. Endeavor to picture yourself as acting out your part well and exhibiting the desired qualities. Do not be ashamed to indulge in these daydreams, for they are the prophecies of the things to follow, and you are but rehearsing your part before the day of the performance. Practice makes perfect, 
and if you accustom yourself to acting in a certain way in imagination, you will find it much easier to play your part when the real performance occurs. This may seem childish to many of you, but if you have an actor among your acquaintances, consult him about it, and you will find that he will heartily recommend it. He will tell you what practice does for one in this direction, and how repeated practice and rehearsals may fix a character so firmly in a man's mind that he may find it difficult to divest himself of it after a time. Choose well the part you wish to play, the character you wish to be yours, and then after fixing it well in your mind, practice, practice, practice. Keep your ideal constantly before you and endeavor to grow into it, and you will succeed if you exercise patience and perseverance. But more than this, do not confine your practice to mere private rehearsals. You need some dress rehearsals as well, rehearsals in public. Therefore, after you get well started in your work, manage to exercise your growing character habits in your everyday life. Pick out the little cases first and try it on them. You will find that you will be able to overcome conditions that formerly bothered you much. You will become conscious of a growing strength and power coming from within, and you will recognize that you are indeed a changed person. Let your thought express itself in action whenever you get a good chance. But do not try to force chances just to try your strength. Do not, for instance, try to force people to ask for favors that you may say no. You will find plenty of genuine tests without forcing any. Accustom yourself to looking people in the eye and feeling the power that is back of you and within you. You will soon be able to see through their personality and realize that it is just one portion of this little life gazing at another portion and that therefore there is nothing to be afraid of. A realization of your real self will enable you to maintain your poise under trying circumstances if you will but throw aside your false idea about your personality. Forget yourself, your little personal self, for a while, and fix your mind on the universal self of which you are a part. All these things that have worried you are but incidents of the personal life and are seen to be illusions when viewed from the standpoint of the universal life. Carry the universal life with you as much as possible into your everyday life. It belongs there as much as anywhere and will prove to be a tower of strength and refuge to you in the perplexing situations of your busy life. Remember always that the ego is master of the mental states and habits and that the will is the direct instrument of the ego and is always ready for its use. Let your soul be filled with a strong desire to cultivate those mental habits that will make you strong. Nature's plan is to produce strong individual expressions of herself, and she will be glad to give you her aid in becoming strong. The man who wishes to strengthen himself will always find great forces back of him to aid him in the work, for is he not carrying out one of nature's pet plans, and one which she has been striving for throughout the ages? Anything that tends to make you realize and express your mastery tends to strengthen you and places at your disposal nature's aid. You may witness this in everyday life. Nature seems to like strong individuals and delights in pushing them ahead. By mastery, we mean mastery over your own lower nature, as well as over outside nature, of course. The eye is master, forget it not, O student, and assert it constantly. Peace be with you. Mantram or Affirmation I am the master of my mental habits. I control my character. I will to be strong and summon the forces of my nature to my aid. End of the 11th lesson. Recording by Arabella Grayson. The 12th lesson of a series of lessons in Raja Yoga. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arabella Grayson. A series of lessons in Raja Yoga by Yogi Ramasharaka. The Twelfth Lesson, Part 1. The Twelfth Lesson, Subconscious Influences. In this lesson, we wish to touch upon a certain feature of subconscious mentation that has been much dwelt upon by certain schools of Western writers and students during the past 20 years. 
but which has also been misunderstood and alas too often misused by some of those who have been attracted to the subject we allude to what has been called the power of thought while this power is very real and like any other of the forces of nature may be properly used and applied in our everyday life still many students of the power of the mind have misused it and have stooped to practices worthy only of the followers of the schools of black magic we hear on all sides of the use of treatments for selfish and often base ends those following these practices seeming to be in utter ignorance of the occult laws brought into operation and the terrible reaction inevitably falling to the lot of those practicing this negative form of mental influence we have been amazed at the prevailing ignorance concerning the nature and effects of this improper use of mental force and at the same time at the common custom of such selfish improper uses this more particularly when the true occultist knows that these things are not necessary even to those who seek success by mental forces there is a true method of the use of mental forces as well as an improper use and we trust that in this lesson we may be able to bring the matter sharply and clearly before the minds of our students in our first course the fourteen lessons in the several lessons entitled respectively thought dynamics telepathy etc and psychic influence we have given a general idea of the effect of one mind upon other minds and many other writers have called the attention of the western world to the same facts there has been a general awakening of interest in this phase of the subject among the western people of late years and many and wonderful are the theories that have been advanced among the conflicting schools regarding the matter but notwithstanding the conflicting theories there is a general agreement upon the fundamental facts they all agree that the mental forces may be used to affect oneself and others and many have started in to use these mental forces for their own selfish ends and purposes believing that they were fully justified in so doing and being unaware of the web of psychic causes and effects which they were weaving around them by their practices now at the beginning let us impress upon the minds of our students the fact while it is undoubtedly true that people who are unaware of the true sources of strength within them may be and often are affected by mental force exerted by others it is equally true that no one can be adversely affected in this way providing he realizes the i within himself which is the only real part of him and which is an impregnable tower of strength against the assaults of others there is no cause for all of this fear that is being manifested by many western students of thought power who are in constant dread of being treated adversely by other people the man or woman who realizes the i within may by the slightest exercise of the will surround himself with the mental aura which will repel adverse thought waves emanating from the minds of others nay more than this the habitual recognition of the eye and a few moments meditation upon it each day will of itself erect such an aura and will charge this aura with a vitality that will turn back adverse thought and cause it to return to the source from which it came where it will serve the good purpose of bringing to the mistaken mind originating it the conviction that such practices are hurtful and to be avoided this realization of the eye which we brought out in the first few lessons of the present series is the best and only real method of self-protection this may be easily understood when we remind you that the whole phenomena of mental influencing belongs to the illusion side of existence the negative side and that the real and positive side must of necessity be stronger nothing can affect the real in you and the nearer you get to the real in realization and understanding the stronger do you become this is the whole secret think it over but there are comparatively few people who are able to rest firmly in the eye consciousness all the time and the others demand help while they are growing to such we would say creep as close to the realization of the eye as possible and rest your spiritual feet firmly upon the rock of the real self if you feel that people circumstances or things are influencing you unduly stand up boldly and deny the influence 
say something like this, I deny the power or influence of persons, circumstances, or things to adversely affect me. I assert my reality, power, and dominion over these things. These words may seem very simple, but when uttered with the consciousness of the truth underlying them, they become as a mighty force. You will understand, of course, that there is no magic or virtue in the words themselves, that is, in the grouping of the letters forming the words, or the sounds of the words, the virtue resting in the idea of which the words are the expression. You will be surprised at the effect of this statement upon depressing or adverse influences surrounding you. If you, you who are reading these words now, feel yourself subject to any adverse or depressing influences, will then stand up erect, throwing your shoulders back, raising your head, and looking boldly and fearlessly ahead, and repeat these words firmly and with faith, you will feel the adverse influences disappearing. You will almost see the clouds falling back from you. Try it now before reading further and you will become conscious of a new strength and power. You are perfectly justified in thus denying adverse influence. You have a perfect right to drive back threatening or depressing thought clouds. You have a perfect right to take your stand upon the rock of truth, your real self, and demand your freedom. These negative thoughts of the world in general, and of some people in particular, belong to the dark side of life and you have a right to demand freedom from them. You do not belong to the same idea of life, and it is your privilege, yes, your duty to repel them and bid them disappear from your horizon. You are a child of light, and it is your right and duty to assert your freedom from the things of darkness. You are merely asserting the truth when you affirm your superiority and dominion over these dark forces and in the measure of your recognition and faith will be the power at your disposal. Faith and recognition renders man a god. If we could but fully recognize and realize just what we are, we could rise above this entire plane of negative, dark world of thought. But we have become so blinded and stupefied with the race thought of fear and weakness, and so hypnotized with the suggestions of weakness that we hear on all sides of us, that even the best of us find it hard to avoid occasionally sinking back into the lower depths of despair and discouragement. But let us remember this, brothers and sisters, that these periods of backsliding become less frequent and last a shorter time as we proceed. By and by we shall escape them altogether. Some may think that we are laying too much stress upon the negative side of the question but we feel that what we have said is timely and much needed by many who read these lessons. There has been so much said regarding this negative adverse power of thought that it is well that all should be taught that it is in their power to rise above this thing, that the weapon for its defeat is already in their hand. The most advanced student may occasionally forget that he is superior to the adverse influence of race thought and other clouds of thought influence that happen to be in his neighborhood. When we think of how few there are who are sending forth the positive hopeful thought waves and how many are sending forth continually the thoughts of discouragement, fear, and despair, it is no wonder that at times there comes to us a feeling of discouragement, helplessness, and what's the use? But we must be ever alert to stand up and deny these things out of existence so far as our personal thought world is concerned. There is a wonderful occult truth in the last sentence. We are the makers, preservers, and destroyers of our personal thought world. We may bring into it that which we desire to appear. We may keep there what we wish, cultivating, developing, and unfolding the thought forms that we desire. We may destroy that which we wish to keep out. The I is the master of its thought world. Think over this great truth, O student. By desire we call into existence. By affirmation we preserve and encourage. By denial we destroy. The Hindus, in their popular religious conceptions, picture the one being as a trinity composed of Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the preserver, 
and Shiva, the destroyer. Not three gods, as is commonly supposed, but a trinity composed of three aspects of deity or being. The idea of the threefold being is also applicable to the individual, as above, so below. The I is the being of the individual, and the thought world is its manifestation. It creates, preserves, and destroys as it will. Carry this idea with you and realize that your individual thought world is your own field of manifestation. In it you are constantly creating, constantly preserving, constantly destroying. And if you can destroy anything in your own thought world, you remove it from its field of activity so far as you are concerned. And if you create anything in your own thought world, you bring it into active being so far as you are concerned. And if you preserve anything, you keep it by you in effect and full operation and influence in your life. This truth belongs to the higher phases of the subject, for its explanation is inextricably bound up in the explanation of the thing in itself, the absolute and its manifestations. But even what we have said above should give to the alert student sufficient notice to cause him to grasp the facts of the case and to apply the principles in his own life. If one lives on the plane of the race thought, he is subject to its laws, for the law of cause and effect is in full operation on each plane of life. But when one raises himself above the race thought and on to the plane of the recognition of the real self, the I, then does he extricate himself from the lower laws of cause and effect and places himself on a higher plane of causation, in which he plays a much higher part. And so we are constantly reminding you that your tower of strength and refuge lies in the higher plane. But nevertheless, we must deal with the things and laws of the lower plane, because very few who read these lessons are able to rest entirely upon the higher plane. The great majority of them have done no more than to lift themselves partially onto the higher plane, and they are consequently living on both planes, partly in each the consequence being that there is a struggle between the conflicting laws of the two planes. The present stage is one of the hardest on the path of attainment and resembles the birth pains of the physical body. But you are being born into a higher plane, and the pain after becoming the most acute will begin to ease and in the end will disappear, and then will come peace and calm. When the pain becomes the most acute, then be cheered with the certainty that you have reached the crisis of your new spiritual birth and that you will soon gain peace. And then you will see that the peace and bliss will be worth all the pain and struggle. Be brave, fellow followers of the path. Deliverance is nigh. Soon will come the silence that follows the storm. The pain that you are experiencing, ah, well do we know that you are experiencing the pain, is not punishment but is a necessary part of your growth. All life follows this plan. The pains of labor and birth ever precede the deliverance. Such is life, and life is based upon truth, and all is well with the world. We did not intend to speak of these things in this lesson, but as we write, there comes to us a great cry for help and a word of encouragement and hope from the class which is taking this course of lessons and we feel bound to respond as we have done. Peace be with you, one and all. And now we will begin our consideration of the laws governing what we have called subconscious influence. All students of the occult are aware of the fact that men may be and are largely influenced by the thoughts of others. Not only is this the case in instances where thoughts are directed from the mind of one person to the mind of another, but also when there is no special direction or intention in the thought sent forth. The vibrations of thoughts linger in the astral atmosphere long after the effort that sent forth the thought has passed. The astral atmosphere is charged with the vibrations of thinkers of many years past and still possesses sufficient vitality to affect those whose minds are ready to receive them at this time. And we all attract to us thought vibrations corresponding in nature with those which we are in the habit of entertaining. The law of attraction is in full operation, and one who makes a study of the subject 
may see instances of it on all sides. We invite to ourselves these thought vibrations by maintaining and entertaining thoughts along certain lines. If we cultivate a habit of thinking along the lines of cheerfulness, brightness, and optimism, we attract to ourselves similar thought vibrations of others, and we will find that before long we will find all sorts of cheerful thoughts pouring into our minds from all directions. And likewise, if we harbor thoughts of gloom, despair, pessimism, we lay ourselves open to the influx of similar thoughts which have emanated from the minds of others. Thoughts of anger, hate, or jealousy attract similar thoughts which serve to feed the flame and keep alive the fire of these low emotions. Thoughts of love tend to draw to ourselves the loving thoughts of others which tend to fill us with a glow of loving emotion. And not only are we affected in this way by the thoughts of others, but what is known as suggestion also plays an important part in this matter of subconscious influence. We find that the mind has a tendency to reproduce the emotions, moods, shades of thought, and feelings of other persons as evidenced by their attitude, appearance, facial expression, or words. If we associate with persons of a gloomy temperament, we run the risk of catching their mental trouble by the law of suggestion, unless we understand this law and counteract it. In the same way, we find that cheerfulness is contagious, and if we keep in the company of cheerful people, we are very apt to take on their mental quality. The same rule applies to frequenting the company of unsuccessful or successful people, as the case may be. If we allow ourselves to take up the suggestions constantly emanating from them, we will find that our minds will begin to reproduce the tones, attitudes, characteristics, dispositions, and traits of the other persons, and before long, we will be living on the same mental plane. As we have repeatedly said, these things are true only when we allow ourselves to take on the impressions, but unless one has mastered the law of suggestion and understands its principles and operations, he is more or less apt to be affected by it. All of you readily recall the effect of certain persons upon others with whom they come in contact. One has a faculty of inspiring with vigor and energy those in whose company he happens to be. Another depresses those around him and is avoided as a human wet blanket. Another will cause a feeling of uneasiness in those around him by reason of his prevailing attitude of distrust, suspicion, and low cunning. Some carry an atmosphere of health around them, while others seem to be surrounded with a sickly aura of disease, even when their physical condition does not seem to indicate the lack of health. Mental states have a subtle way of impressing themselves upon us, and the student who will take the trouble to closely observe those with whom he comes in contact will receive a liberal education along these lines. There is, of course, a great difference in the degree of suggestibility among different persons. There are those who are almost immune, while at the other end of the line are to be found others who are so constantly and strongly impressed by the suggestions of others, conscious or unconscious, that they may be said to scarcely have any independent thought or will of their own. But nearly all persons are suggestible to a greater or lesser degree. It must not be supposed, from what we have said, that all suggestions are bad, harmful, or undesirable. Many suggestions are very good for us, and coming at the right time, have aided us much. But, nevertheless, it is well to always let your own mind pass upon these suggestions before allowing them to manifest in your subconscious mind. Let the final decision be your own, and not the will of another although you may have considered outside suggestions in connection with the matter. End of the Twelfth Lesson, Part 1 Recording by Arabella Grayson The Twelfth Lesson of a Series of Lessons in Raja Yoga This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arabella Grayson A Series of Lessons in Raja Yoga by Yogi Ramasharaka The Twelfth Lesson, Part 2 
Remember always that you are an individual, having a mind and will of your own. Rest firmly upon the base of your I consciousness, and you will find yourself able to manifest a wonderful strength against the adverse suggestions of others. Be your own suggester. Train and influence your subconscious mind yourself, and do not allow it to be tampered with by the suggestions of others. Grow the sense of individuality. There has been much written of recent years in the Western world regarding the effect of the mental attitude upon success and attainment upon the material plane. While much of this is nothing but the wildest imagining, still there remains a very firm and solid substratum of truth underlying it all. It is undoubtedly true that one's prevailing mental attitude is constantly manifesting and objectifying itself in his life. Things, circumstances, people, plans, all seem to fit into the general ideal of the strong mental attitude of a man, and this from the operation of mental law along a number of lines of action. In the first place, the mind when directed toward a certain set of objects becomes very alert to discover things concerning those objects, to seize upon things, opportunities, persons, ideas, and facts tending to promote the objects thought of. The man who is looking for facts to prove certain theories invariably finds them, and is also quite likely to overlook facts tending to disprove his theory. The optimist and the pessimist, passing along the same streets, each sees thousands of examples tending to fit in with his idea. As Kay says, when one is engaged in seeking for a thing, if he keep the image of it clearly before the mind, he will be very likely to find it, and that too, probably, where it would otherwise have escaped his notice. So when one is engaged in thinking on a subject, thoughts of things resembling it or bearing upon it and tending to illustrate it come up on every side, Truly, we may well say of the mind, as has been said of the eye, that it perceives only what it brings within the power of perceiving. John Burroughs has well said regarding this, that no one ever found the walking fern who did not have the walking fern in his mind. A person whose eye is full of Indian relics picks them up in every field he walks through. They are quickly recognized because the eye has been commissioned to find them. When the mind is kept firmly fixed upon some ideal or aim, its whole and varied powers are bent toward the realization and manifestation of that ideal. In thousands of ways, the mind will operate to objectify the subjective mental attitude, a great proportion of the mental effort being accomplished along subconscious lines. It is of the greatest importance to one who wishes to succeed in any undertaking to keep before his mind's eye a clear mental image of that which he desires. He should picture the thing desired and himself as securing it until it becomes almost real. In this way, he calls to his aid his entire mental force and power along the subconscious lines and, as it were, makes a clear path over which he may walk to accomplishment. Bain says regarding this, by aiming at a new construction, we must clearly conceive what is aimed at. Where we have a very distinct and intelligible model before us, we are in a fair way to succeed. In proportion as the ideal is dim and wavering, we stagger or miscarry. Maudsley says, We cannot do an act voluntarily unless we know what we are going to do, and we cannot know exactly what we are going to do until we have taught ourselves to do it. Carpenter says, The continued concentration of attention upon a certain idea gives it a dominant power, not only over the mind, but over the body. Muller says the idea of our own strength gives strength to our movements. A person who is confident of effecting anything by muscular efforts will do it more easily than one not so confident of his own power. Tanner says to believe firmly is almost tantamount in the end to accomplishment. Extraordinary instances are related showing the influence of the will over even the involuntary muscles. Along the same lines, many Western writers have added their testimony to the yogi principle of the manifestation of thought into action. Kay has written, A clear and accurate idea of what we wish to do and how it is to be effected 
is of the utmost value and importance in all of the affairs of life. A man's conduct naturally shapes itself according to the ideas in his mind, and nothing contributes more to success in life than having a high ideal and keeping it constantly in view. Where such is the case, one can hardly fail in attaining it. Numerous unexpected circumstances will be found to conspire to bring it about, and even what seemed at first to be hostile may be converted into means for its furtherance while by having it constantly before the mind he will be ever ready to take advantage of any favoring circumstances that may present themselves. Along the same lines, Foster has written these remarkable words. It is wonderful how even the casualties of life seem to bow to a spirit that will not bow to them, and yield to subserve a design which they may, in their first apparent tendency, threaten to frustrate. When a firm, decisive spirit is recognized, it is curious to see how the space clears around a man and leaves him room and freedom. Simpson has said, A passionate desire and an unwearied will can perform impossibilities, or what seem to be such to the cold and feeble. And Maudsley gives to aspiring youth a great truth when he says, Thus it is that aspirations are often prophecies, the harbingers of what a man shall be in a condition to perform. And we may conclude the paragraph by quoting Lighten, Dream, O youth, dream manfully and nobly, and thy dream shall be prophets. This principle of the power of the mental image is strongly impressed upon the mind of the shela, or student, by the yogi teachers. The student is taught that just as the house is erected in accordance with the plan of the architect, so is one's life built in accordance with the prevailing mental image. The mind subconsciously molds itself around the prevailing mental image or attitude and then proceeds to draw upon the outer world for material with which to build in accordance with the plan. Not only is one's character built in this way, but the circumstances and incidents of his life follow the same rule. The yogi student is instructed into the mysteries of the power of the mind in this direction, not that he may make use of it to build up material success or to realize his personal desires, for he is taught to avoid these things, but he is fully instructed nevertheless that he may understand the workings of the law around him. And it is a fact well known to close students of the occult that the few who have attained extraordinarily high degrees of development make use of this power in order to help the race. Many a world movement has been directed by the mind or minds of some of these advanced souls who are able to see the ideal of evolution ahead of the race, and by visualizing the same and concentrating upon it in meditation, actually hasten the progress of the evolutionary wave and cause to actually manifest that which they saw and upon which they had meditated. It is true that some occultists have used similar plans to further their own selfish personal ends, often without fully realizing just what power they were employing, but this merely illustrates the old fact that the forces of nature may be used rightly and wrongly. It is all the more reason why those who are desirous of advancing the race, of assisting in the evolution of the world, should make use of this mighty power in their work. Success is not reprehensible notwithstanding the fact that many have interpreted and applied the word in such a matter as to make it appear as if it had no other meaning or application other than the crude material selfish one generally attributed to it by reason of its misuse. The Western world is playing its part in the evolution of the race and its keynote is accomplishment. Those who have advanced so high that they are able to view the world of men as one sees a valley from a mountain peak recognize what this strenuous Western life means. They see mighty forces in operation, mighty principles being worked out by those who little dream of the ultimate significance that which they are doing. Mighty things are before the Western world today. Wonderful changes are going on. Great things are in the womb of time, and the hour of birth draws near. The men and women in the Western world feel within them the mighty urge to accomplish something to take an active part in the great drama of life, and they are right in giving full expression to this urge, and are doing well in using every legitimate means in the line of expression. And this idea of the mental attitude or the mental image 
is one of the greatest factors in this striving for success. In this lesson, we do not purpose giving success talks for our students. These lessons are intended to fill another field, and there are many other channels of information along the lines named. What we wish to do is to point out to our students the meaning of all this strenuous striving of the age in the Western world and the leading principle employed therein. The great achievements of the material world are being accomplished by means of the power of the mind. Men are beginning to understand that thought manifests itself in action and that thought attracts to itself the things, persons, and circumstances in harmony with itself. The power of mind is being manifest in hundreds of ways. The power of desire, backed by faith and will, is beginning to be recognized as one of the greatest of known dynamic forces. The life of the race is entering into a new and strange stage of development and evolution, and in the years to come, mind will be seen more clearly and still more clearly to be the great principle underlying the world of material things and happenings. That all is mind is more than a dreamy metaphysical utterance is being recognized by the leaders in the world's thought. As we have said, great changes are before the world and the race, and every year brings us nearer to the beginning of them. In fact, the beginning is already upon us. Let any thinker stop and reflect over the wonderful changes of the past six years since the dawning of the 20th century and he will be dull indeed if he sees not the trend of affairs. We are entering into a new great cycle of the race, and the old is being prepared for being dropped off like an old worn-out husk. Old conventions, ideals, customs, laws, ethics, and things sociological, economical, theological, philosophical, and metaphysical have been outgrown and are about to be shed by the race. The great cauldron of human thought is bubbling away fiercely, and many things are rising to its surface. Like all great changes, the good will come only with much pain. All birth is with pain. The race feels the pain and perpetual unrest, but knows not what is the disease nor the remedy. Many false cases of diagnosis and prescription are even now noticeable, and will become still more in evidence as the years roll by. Many self-styled saviors of the race, prescribers for the pain of the soul and mind, will arise and fall, but out of it all will come that for which the race now waits. The changes that are before us are as great as the changes in thought in life described in the late novel by H. G. Wells, entitled, In the Days of the Comet. In fact, Mr. Wells has indicated in that story some of the very changes that the advanced souls of the race have informed their students are before the race. The prophetic insight of the writer named seems marvelous until one realizes that even that writer is being used as a part of the mental machinery of the change itself. But the change will not come about by reason of the new gas caused by the brushing of the Earth's surface by a passing comet. It will come from the unfolding of the race mind the process being now under way. Are not the signs of mental unrest and discomfort becoming more and more apparent as the days go by? The pain is growing greater and the race is beginning to fret and chafe and moan. It knows not what it wants, but it knows that it feels pain and wants something to relieve that pain. The old things are beginning to totter and fall, and ideas rendered sacred by years of observance are being brushed aside with a startling display of irreverence. Under the surface of our civilization, we may hear the straining and groaning of the ideas and principles that are striving to force their way out onto the plane of manifestation. Men are running hither and thither, crying for a leader and a savior. They are trying this thing and that thing, but they find not that which they seek. They cry for satisfaction, but it eludes them. And yet all this search and disappointment is part of the great change and is preparing the race for that which must come. And yet the relief will not come from anything or things. It will come from within. Just as when, in Wells' story, things righted themselves when the vapor of the comet had cleared men's minds, so will things take their new places when the mind of the race becomes cleared by the new unfoldment that is even now underway. Men are beginning to feel each other's pains. They find themselves unsatisfied by the old rule of every man for himself and the devil take the hindmost. 
It used to content the successful, but now it doesn't seem to be so satisfying. The man on top is becoming lonesome and dissatisfied and discontented. His success seems to appall him in some mysterious manner. And the man underneath feels stirring within himself strange longings and desires and dissatisfaction. And new frictions are arising, and new and startling ideas are being suddenly advanced, supported, and opposed. And the relations between people seem to be unsatisfactory. The old rules, laws, and bounds are proving irksome. New, strange, and wild thoughts are coming into the minds of people, which they dare not utter to their friends. And yet these same friends are finding similar ideas within themselves. And somehow underneath it all is to be found a certain honesty. Yes, there is where the trouble seems to come. The world is tiring of hypocrisy and dishonesty in all human relations and is crying aloud to be led back some way to truth and honesty in thought and action. But it does not see the way out and it will not see the way out until the race mind unfolds still further and the pain of the new enfoldment is stirring the race to its depths from the deep recesses of the race mind arising to the surface old passions relics from the cave dweller days and all sorts of ugly mental relics of the past and they will continue to rise and show themselves until at last the bubbling pot will begin to quiet down and then will come a new peace and the best will come to the surface the essence of all the experiences of the race to our students we would say, during the struggle ahead of the race, play well your part, doing the best you can, living each day by itself, meeting each new phase of life with confidence and courage. Be not deluded by appearances, nor follow after strange prophets. Let the evolutionary processes work themselves out. And do you fall in with the wave without struggling and without overmuch striving? The law is working itself out well, of that be assured. Those who have entered into even a partial understanding and recognition of the one life underlying will find that they will be as the chosen people during the changes that are coming to the race. They have attained that which the race is reaching toward in pain and travail. And the force behind the law will carry them along, for they will be the leaven that is to lighten the great mass of the race in the new dispensation not by deed or by action but by thought will these people leaven the mass the thought is even now at work and all who read these words are playing a part in the work although they may know it not if the race could realize this truth of the one life underlying today the change would occur in a moment but it will not come in that way when this understanding gradually dawns upon the race this new consciousness then will things take their proper places, and the lion and the lamb lie down together, in peace. We have thought it well to say these things, and this the last lesson of this course. They are needed words. They will serve to point out the way to those who are able to read. Watch and wait for the silence that will follow the storm. In this series of lessons, we have endeavored to give you a plain, practical presentation of some of the more important features of Raja Yoga. But this phase of the subject, as important and interesting as it is, is not the highest phase of the great yoga teachings. It is merely the preparation of the soil of the mind for what comes afterward. The phase called Nani Yoga, the Yoga of Wisdom, is the highest of all the various phases of yoga. Although each of the lower steps is important in itself, we find ourselves approaching the phase of our work for which we have long wished. Those who have advised and directed this work have counseled us to deal with the less advanced and simpler phases in order to prepare the minds of those who might be interested, so that they would be ready for the higher teachings. At times we have felt an impatience for the coming of the day when we would be able to teach the highest that has come to us and now the time seems to have come. Following this course, we will begin a series of lessons in Nani Yoga, the Yoga of Wisdom, in which we will pass on to our students the highest teachings regarding the reality and its manifestations, the one and the many. The teachings that all is mind will be explained in such a manner as to be understood by all who have followed us so far. 
we will be able to impart to you the higher truths about spiritual evolution, sometimes called reincarnation, as well as spiritual cause and effect, often called karma. The highest truths about these important subjects are often obscured by popular misconceptions occasioned by partial teachings. We trust that you, our students, will wish to follow us still higher, higher than we have ventured so far, and we assure you that there is a truth to be seen and known that is as much higher than the other phases upon which we have touched as those phases have been higher than the current beliefs of the masses of the race. We trust that the powers of knowledge may guide and direct us that we may be able to convey our message so that it may be accepted and understood. We thank our students who have traveled thus far with us, and we assure them that their loving sympathy has ever been a help and an inspiration to us. Peace be with you. End of a series of lessons in Raja Yoga by Yogi Ramasharaka. Recording by Aravella Grayson.